now to an unbelievable hoax that police say many people fell victim to. A caller pretending to be a police officer was apparently convincing enough to talk some managers into sexually abusing fast food employees. If I didn't submit to this search, then I'd be either arrested or lose my job or both. A couple of police officers telling me there's a video of what happened here. I'd never seen anything like it, and I've still never seen anything like it in 30 years. I'm on the phone, and he starts telling me the process. Take off her blouse. Here comes one article of clothing off, and then another article of clothing off. Yeah, I don't think there was anywhere he probably didn't touch. Check her crevices for drugs. He wanted him to describe my breasts, what my genitalia looked like, and even my bra size. I was mind blown. How is that? The psychology employed by the caller was amazing. I didn't know what this guy was capable of. I just know that this is a bad guy. The caller, of course, committed the perfect crime because he's completely anonymous. Burger Kings and Taco Bells, every restaurant you could think of was a victim of this caller. We have a sexual predator on the loose, and the phone's still ringing every day. out here it's it's pretty good good place to raise your family good schools not a lot of crap the night that the uh, I got the phone call about the McDonald's case uh, I was at home minding my own business and it was uh, the assistant chief at the time and he said uh, buddy what are you doing I said well I'm sitting there on the couch uh, chilled out watching a little TV and uh, he said, well, I need you to come out. I'm out here at the McDonald's, and uh, I don't know how the hell to explain it to you. He said, there's just some bad things happening out here, and I need you. It was uh, April the 9th, 2004. I had only been promoted in approximately three weeks. I, I guess you would say I was a rookie detective. I roll into McDonald's, I really don't have an idea of what's going on. police cars everywhere, people coming and going. I walk into the restaurant, and uh, McDonald's was still doing business. We went through the kitchen area and back a hallway. You could tell that it was an atmosphere where everybody was just upset. And like they seen something they couldn't believe was happening. I saw the victim in the back office. She appeared to be upset, head, head hanging down. We had a manager that was upset. I had an assistant manager was upset. It was like a whirlwind going on. And I'm thinking, oh, what in the hell have they got me into? They were trying to explain to me what had happened, but what they were saying didn't make a lot of sense. And all I could understand was that we had something to do with this phone call. And then one of the officers there told me, said, uh, there's a video of what happened here. And I said, what? There was a CCTV camera in here recording everything. I said, I right, stop right here. Let's see exactly what happened. Started watching the video. There's no sound. So you can only go by what you see, sort of like watch the silent movies. Donna Summers, who was the assistant manager. She's on the phone with somebody. On this particular day, a call came in to the restaurant. And the assistant manager at the restaurant, Donna Summers, 51 years old, takes the call. And uh, it's a gentleman on the other line saying that he is a police officer. and that he has the manager of the McDonald's on the line with him, along with a corporate representative. And he's got some very serious business to talk about. 
one of her employees uh, has been accused of stealing a wallet from a customer who had been there. He describes her as petite, uh, brunette hair. And Donna Summer says, yes, we have that employee. I know exactly who that is. As I'm uh, watching the video, the young woman comes into the room. You could see them talking back and forth. Louise Ogborn, 18 years old, was working at McDonald's because her mom uh, had recently lost her job. And on this particular day, they were very busy, and she offered to stay and help with the dinner rush. So at that point, uh, Donna Summers takes Louise Ogborn to the back office. She told me that I had been accused of stealing some money from my customer's purse. I just remember being distraught. I was so upset that somebody would blame me for something so horrible. The person on the phone, the police officer, then tells Miss Summers, now here's what we can do. We can either arrest her at the restaurant, or if you want to help us out, we need you to conduct a strip search and see if she has the money on her. She started asking me to empty my pockets, and I turned my pockets inside out. Next thing you know, Another assistant manager walks in as well, and they got a garbage bag, and they put that over the door. And so you couldn't look in from the hallway and see what was going on inside that office. Thought it was strange, but I guess they were trying to make the victim more comfortable uh, with what was uh, going to happen. It's hard to imagine what Donna Summers is thinking. This caller sounds very legitimate. He's very calm. He's giving the orders very authoritatively. And Donna Summers is obeying all of these commands from the officer. Even Louise complies, even though she doesn't really want to. She keeps, you know, protesting, saying she didn't do this. So she's probably thinking, well, they're going to realize this isn't me, and I'll just obey right now, and hopefully they'll let me out of this situation. But uh, that's when it become more uh, bizarre. All of a sudden, here comes one article of clothing off, and then another article of clothing off. And the next thing you know, the victim has nothing on but her underwear and her bra. And all of a sudden, they're taking off their remove too. She's just standing there just naked. I mean, there's not a stitch of clothes on at all. And I'm thinking, what's going to happen next? probably an hour into the phone call. I was just standing my mouth hung open, not being able to believe what I was seeing. After they remove her clothing, they give her an apron, and she's trying to conceal herself as best as she can. I was completely undressed. I was embarrassed. Next thing you know, they're, they're bagging her personal belongings up, and they take them out of the room. So here's Louise Ogborn sitting there naked with a little apron over her, realizing that even if she wants to get out of that situation, there is a restaurant full of customers that she's gonna have to run through naked, and then what's she gonna do? So she's stuck back there. I didn't know what was behind the door. I didn't know if somebody was waiting for me, or, and I didn't wanna run out naked, and I was just really scared. What choice did Louise have at this point but to obey? This young lady's not being strip searched. She's a prisoner in, in her own place of employment. She's upset. Uh, you could see it in her face that she was uh, traumatized at the situation that she was in. 
I can only imagine an 18-year-old, what's going through your mind. This is someone who has always followed orders probably in her life. Her life has been about order. Going to church, going to Girl Scouts, going to school. Grew up in a typical military home, highly disciplined. I was taught when my dad, my mom told me to do something that I absolutely did it. Um, if any other adult told me to do something, I absolutely did it, no arguments. And then the next thing you know, this man had come into the office and he's a middle-aged man. He doesn't have an employee uniform or an apron or anything on. This whole thing has been going on for hours. And Donna Summers, she's trying to run a restaurant that's very busy at that time of day. But every time she starts kind of wondering why is this taking so long, he seems to have an answer. We're on our way, you know, we just don't have many people working today, just bear with us. So that sounds like a legitimate answer to Summers. However, she needs to get back to work. And the officer says, well, look, do you have a man in your life who you trust? Do you have a husband, a boyfriend, someone you can maybe bring in who could watch her until we get there? And so Donna Summers says, yes, actually, I, I have a fiance, Walter. He could come down. I'm thinking, what part of being the right thing to do did you think this was? Uh, the manager leaves, and he takes the phone. And now Walter Nix is listening to the caller and following his directions. He says to Louise, all right, he wants you to go ahead and drop the apron. Then the police officer says, can she do some jumping jacks? She could run in place. She needs to shake. We need to see if anything falls out. You never know where she may have hid something. She's now been in the room nearly two hours. And I see these acts going on, jumping jacks, naked, jogging in place, uh, standing in a chair. It just kept going on and on. In the meantime, from time to time, Donna Summers comes back into the office. And each time she comes back in, you can see Louise Ogborn covering herself with the apron. She doesn't think anything's going on. She thinks he's just sitting there listening to the police officer and watching her until the police get there. Louise is not getting any help at all from Donna Summers. So at that point, Louise has to think, I'm all alone here. Nobody's going to help me. I was doing what I had to do to survive. The caller was telling me to say yes, sir, no, sir. And if I didn't, I'd get punished. And it just kept getting worse the further the video went. Even had a young lady turned over his lap, and he would was spanking her uh, naked buttocks. And I mean, to the, to the point that uh, you could even see the red marks. And uh, uh, spanking continues on and off for about 20 minutes. Louise Ogborn is humiliated, scared. She's probably afraid for her life at this point. I was crying the whole time. He had already hit me, beat me, and there's no telling what he could have done if I stood up for myself and tried to get help. As the video progressed, uh, it, it went to a dark hour. Uh, Walter Nix is then instructed to have Louise Ogborn set on his lap. We can check her breath. We might, you might be able to tell if she has any drugs or alcohol on her breath. And the police officer tells him to have Louise Ogborn give him a kiss. The police officer tells, you know, Walter Nix, I need her to perform a sexual act and he instructed her to do so. Uh, 
Walter Nix actually had the victim perform oral sex on him. No one understands how this went forward, but it did go forward. I was numb. I don't remember feeling anything. I just blanked my mind. I just made it to where I wasn't really there mentally. It was very hard to watch, and uh, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And uh, I got pretty upset about it. So Walter Nix has to be thinking to himself, what did I just do? And he realizes he's done wrong. He knew he had to be doing wrong because he takes off. At this point, I saw enough that I knew we had a felony that had occurred. I struck one of the police officers to go to his address, find him, and bring him to the police department. Well, he was as much at fault as, as the caller. In fact, he probably he was in more at fault, because just saw somebody tells you something don't mean you have to do it. So then, at that point, Donna Summers is like, what am I going to do? So then here comes an older gentleman in who's a custodian that was off duty. He gets on the phone. He hears a few words of it and says, this, no way, this is not happening. This isn't right. He had enough common sense to realize, wait a minute, is this a real police officer? He tells Donna Summers that this was not a real call. Then she finally seems to realize, wait a minute, is this all not real? And everything stops. This whole thing is a hoax. And uh, that's when they realized they'd been scammed. Through my mind, I'm thinking, who's this caller? Surely to God, he's not a cop. My only thought was, how in the hell can a guy get his enjoyment out of, out of doing this over the phone? But obviously, he got gratification strictly by hearing what's going on. While all kinds of thoughts ran through my mind, I knew we needed to take the victim's statement. That's when I sat down across from her and uh, looked her in the eye. I realized I knew her. Yeah, she was my neighbor. Uh, and I said, Louise? She said, yeah, buddy, it's me. And uh, I mean, hell, her dad was a friend of mine. We just grew up together. And uh, that hit me right between the eyes. And uh, the case became very personal. Uh, gave me more drive. Uh, made me more determined that I'm going to find out who the hell did this. And I'm going to put their ass in jail. The next shift I worked, or I went through the statements and collect more information possibly that would help me solve this. I felt our case was like a needle in a haystack right off the bat. And then all of a sudden, I was sitting there and I thought, I'm gonna search the internet. Punch in McDonald's strip search and boom. There came up a lot of information from all restaurants and other retail establishments where this had happened across the nation. Every case was almost the exact same MO. Some cases even used the same uh, police officer's name, the Detective Scott. We had a McDonald's in Hinesville, Georgia, where a older custodian uh, did a body cavity search on a female employee. Had a Taco Bell in Phoenix, Arizona. The manager picked out a customer that fit the description on the phone and searched her. In 95, we're at a McDonald's in Raleigh, North Carolina. 98, we're in Oak Brook, Illinois. And so he just bounced all over the place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
Taco Bells and Burger Kings and Hardee's and Applebee's and every restaurant you could think of was a victim of this caller. I realize I have information on 73 cases in 32 states. The first call that we were able to determine was in, in 1994. Here I am in 2004. I knew everybody was looking at me. This was going to be a defining moment in my career. Dangerous, almost unbelievable hoax repeated across the nation many times. And now to an unbelievable hoax that police say many people fell victim to. We know that it was at 70 different locations all over the country, as you can see. Detective Stump is considered a hero to the young girl for tracking down hundreds of calls. Subject uh, had a way of getting inside of people's minds. I didn't realize at first, but I was handed a case that uh, ended up being a monster. And there's nobody to solve this but me. We were afraid that uh, constantly every week more people were going to be hurt. I'm very concerned that we have a sexual predator on the loose. My thought is, what's going to happen tonight? What business is going to get hit? What young victim is going to be victimized? Somebody had to stop this monster from what he was doing. It's a large nationwide investigation. The same hoax played out at 69 other businesses in 32 states over 10 years. This case was way bigger than me, but uh, there was two things I never wanted to hear. I never wanted to hear the word no and don't tell me I can't. I knew that to catch this guy, I needed to understand his particular MO, and to do that, I needed to understand more about his past cases. Blackwood's a nice, close-knit community. It's a small farming town, conservative and fairly religious. I always felt safe. I was raised to respect the authority of people in charge of me, teachers, people at church, uh, those that are older than me. I was 16 years old when I took this job. And I was thrilled when I got the position because it's like, I'm gonna be earning my own money. I was a loyal, dutiful, like always early employee. It was December 16th, 1999. Just a ordinary cold December weeknight. Suddenly I was called back to the office by name. The manager told me that he was on the phone with someone named Officer Davis from the Blackfoot Police Department. Because a woman had been at our establishment earlier that evening, her purse was stolen and it had a $50 bill in it, and she knows that one of the servers took it. And then they stated that it was um, the person she thinks had her purse was a female server, a little over five foot, and blonde hair. Where I was protesting that I'm not five foot, I'm not blonde, it was not me, you know. I was adamant it wasn't me. No matter what I said, the officer had a believable, plausible, reasonable answer for everything. Officer wanted the clothes removed piece by piece, and it began with removing shoes, and then it was my pants, and then it was my uniform shirt. So just a progression of one item at a time with lots of talk between. As it goes on, I'm just getting more hysterical because I'm just pleading and pleading and pleading, and I just kept saying, this isn't right, this isn't right. It doesn't matter, it even seemed to kind of anger the officer even more. He was asking that my manager describe my body. He wanted him to describe my breasts, what my genitalia looked like, and even my bra size. And that's when I snatched the phone away and was screaming, how in the world could my bra cup size and all this type of stuff have anything at all to do with this allegedly stolen $50 bill? 
even though I was extremely violated and traumatized, I didn't feel personally empowered enough to just get the hell out of there. And right about that time, my coworker Derek came in and could tell something was wrong. I was 22 at the time, 1999 in Blackfoot, Idaho. Uh, jobs are kind of limited for our area, so I ended up getting a job at a pizza parlor. I was 22 at the time. Most of our waiting staff were under the age of 18. I went through the employee entrance. Immediately, I noticed that something was really wrong and asked the cook what was going on because I could see no wait staff. It was just the cook, a pile of pizzas, breadsticks for days, carryouts waiting to be boxed up. Like it was chaos for a pizza parlor. And I, I said, what is going on? And she's like, something's going on in the office. When I turned the corner and I seen the manager, he looks up at me. I'll just never forget the sweat pouring off his body. I've never seen anything like it to this day. I see a young lady getting strip searched. I said, what the fuck are you doing? And he said, there's a cop on the phone and I'm doing a strip search for the police. And I grabbed the phone and I said, who is this? And the guy says, this is an officer with the Blackfoot Police Department. He sounded cool, calm, collected, like this is something he does every day. And I said, then you of all people should know this manager should not be strip searching a minor, especially a female. I was like, we need to get the real cops here. And he hung up. It took an outsider coming in and being alarmed at the information enough to act and do something and, and stop the situation. I was very grateful for his intervention. I wish I would have been there sooner. I did what I was supposed to do when I got there. It pisses me off that somebody's going to take advantage of people like that. When I realized it was a hoax and that this was just a person impersonating a real police officer, I was outraged. In 1999, I would have said 100% the manager is involved with this. And after learning that this has happened so many times in so many different states, I just don't see how it's plausible for him to be involved. You know, I, I honestly don't think that anybody at these restaurants were involved. I think that they were honestly just taken advantage of. Then went home, but stayed up pretty late and wrote down, recounted the whole story. just being able to sit down with, with my legal pad and even make it through my account. That was really hard. I was so personally wronged, and I was discouraged to learn that there was no way that the police were gonna put significant resources into checking this out or following up. It wasn't a priority for them. What's really hard to believe is that somebody was doing this all over the place and just kind of getting away with it. Were all the cases not investigated? Were people afraid to report it? This case is so bizarre, it's hard to describe. We had the proof, the undeniable video evidence that, that this did happen. The other agencies didn't have that. They didn't have nothing but a statement of somebody saying, this is what happened to me. As far as I knew, I was the only person investigating this thing. I had no idea someone else was on to him, too. An unbelievable phone scam hit four branches of Wendy's near Boston late Friday. The caller claimed to be a police officer and was able to trick managers into performing illegal strip searches on employees. In the most shocking case, a young female manager was tricked into sexually assaulting a male server. It was just really horrific what the victims went through. It 
It really piqued my interest. Because of the bizarre nature, usually we did a lot of drug cases, you know. On a daily basis, we'd be out buying heroin, buying cocaine, the fad drugs I call Molly and, and Oxycontin. So yesterday, we're buying heroin. Today, I'm tracking a hoax caller posing as a police officer. We had no idea where the call came from. We had no suspects, nobody. Got back to the office and basically put my hands overhead going, I don't know how I'm gonna find a suspect. This is a needle in a haystack. Other than the video, I got one piece of evidence. That's the caller ID number from Star 69. An employee at the restaurant was fast thinking enough to think Star 69. And for those of us who remember the landlines, uh, you would put in Star 69, and it would take you back to the last caller. I'm sitting there looking at this phone number. I call it. And I get a busy signal. And I thought, well, no, this can't. I call it again. I get a busy signal. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I've got a phone number, and it's not telling me nothing. I had nothing to go on. I'm doing this investigation basically alone, and it's tough to get going. The first lead in the case was doing what they call a reverse toll on all four locations. I'm getting multiple subpoenas from the judge for these records, and I get a report back saying that the numbers are fake. They go nowhere. We don't know anything else. We don't know if it's a cell number, we know a hotline. We know nothing. I call AT&T and I go through a series of people. They would transfer me to another individual and I'd do the same thing and we'd go to another individual. Finally, after, oh, probably an hour and a half on the phone, I got this lady and uh, I'll never forget it. She said, you know, I think this might be one of our prepaid calling card numbers. And I'm thinking, all right. You remember back in the day, calling cards were used on a daily basis. I called AT&T. You're on hold and says the next representative will get to you in 30 minutes. And you're sitting there waiting. And then somebody picked up the phone. Said this is Michelle with subpoena clients, AT&T, how can I help you? I said, I need to know the originating calling number for these fake numbers. And she said, well, they can't be traced. I said, it makes no sense. You're telling me that you cannot trace these prepaid calling cards at all. And she said, no, they can't be traced. I said, I looked at a calling card. They have different numbers on them. What do these numbers mean? She goes, I don't know. Why do they have a barcode on them? I don't know. And I said, I'm not giving up until you give me an answer. Then she calls me, and she was a little upbeat. She said, I got some answers. Since 9-11, even though we don't want the public to know, Prepaid calling cards are now traceable. I'm like excited. I'm like, here we go. And she says, Vic, the true originating numbers are coming from Panama City, Florida. Touchdown. We have a location. So I know now these are real locations, not fake locations, real. The problem is, is they're pay phones. What good is a payphone? I can't knock on the door. Numerous people use it. I knew when the call was made. I knew the payphone booth. I knew exactly where he was, the time he was at. That's it. We don't have anything else. We don't know anything else. I called Panama City detectives and talked with them. They basically told me that Panama City had received multiple, multiple calls about Calls coming from their area as a hoax, Jose as a police detective, and strip searching people. And I was like, what? I thought this was only us. That just blew my mind. 
At this point, I realized that he's practiced it so many times that he just knew exactly what to say next. And probably didn't win every time. He got hung up on numerous times, but he learned to play the role. He learned to play the game. That's the sick part about it. He got better at it. And when he got better at it, it became more of a drug. He just had to have it. We probably all individually had the feeling that this was only us and felt stupid and dumb about it. But the fact that there were so many women that this happened to makes me feel less foolish and naive. But even in admitting that, it's just, oh, totally demoralizing because I just feel that that's a pretty bold breakdown of justice. I absolutely feel that, that he needs to be apprehended and made to pay for his actions. There was nobody in the United States that could say 100% that their daughter or son was safe from this guy. We need to make sure that we found this caller so that this wasn't happening to any more victims. Some nights, it's hard to go to sleep thinking about it. I needed to know he's behind bars and no other victim is going to fall prey to him. At this point, I was kind of at a standstill because we got to the point where they identified where the calls are made from was a dead end. So now, my next step is to identify where the calling card was purchased. When I finally got that information back, it said that they were bought on February 19th at Walmart in Panama City. Hopefully, this is the big break we were looking for. It's a big company. Big companies have video. So I call Walmart, and I ask for video. I know it was purchased on this time and this date. They tell me, I don't think I can get this, talk to this guy. I don't think I can get this, talk to this guy. So we go from one to the next to the next till I finally get the guy. And he says, yes, I can give you that. So I finally get this VHS tape, put a set up in my office with a TV and a VCR, and I put it in. And as soon as I popped it in, I realized it wasn't what I was expecting at all. You could tell it's just one of these tapes that is continuing to use probably six months. The quality was terrible. It's of seven or eight locations throughout the store. So flash a picture of the jewelry section, flash the entrance. Then it go back again, and it'd be a loop. Flash this one, this one, this one, then back to the entrance. And there's no video in the registers. Surely, if I won't continue watching this, I wouldn't be able to work. It'd just be in a rubber room somewhere because it's insane. Because this video, as much as we slow it down and take some of these other cameras out of the way, still, there could have been a 1,000 men that walked in in that hour. And that's assuming that it's coming in the store and leaving the store shortly before the purchase and directly after the purchase. There's no way I can find anything from this tape. It's impossible. I don't know where to go with this anymore. It's been four months. Four months of hard work. So at this point, I'm at a dead end again. Then I get a call from Buddy Stump of the Mount Washington Police Department. I picked up the phone, and you can tell he's not from Boston. I'm the kind of guy there's no sense of reinventing the wheel. I knew that my phone call had came from Panama City. The detective there advised me that there was a case in uh, Massachusetts, very much like our case. I needed to contact this detective, Vic Flaherty. He was surprised that there was somebody else that had got as far as he had gotten. He's very passionate about it. I was bouncing off the walls. I was tickled to death. I didn't feel like I was a lone ranger anymore. Somebody there had the same drive to try to find this guy that I did. I was really excited to hear and talk with Buddy because it's a brand new case. I've been told that you can help me try to figure out how to track this calling card. I said, just send that information to me and I'll get it to you quicker because I can trace back where the calling card was purchased. And then I went from thinking, 
I don't know if we can solve this case, to hell yes we can solve this case. Everything that I was doing at this point is phone calls. Phone calls to other agencies, phone calls to AT&T. So I call my favorite lady at AT&T and say, you're never gonna guess, another incident, even more horrific. And without a doubt, it's the same person. at and is telling me the Collins used in the Mount Washington hoax it was purchased at a different Walmart store than the one for mine. So I call Walmart. The first question I ask, do we have registered video? And they said, yes. It was like, you're kidding me. Nope, we have it. So I said, all right, pull the tapes. A few days later, I get a VHS tape. I push play. I knew that the purchase was at 302, then creeped it forward a little bit. So then the suspect walks into the picture. I see him putting the stuff on the counter. A white male, between 30 and 40, about six feet tall, black hair. You could see something flat on the belt, what appeared to be a calling card. I looked at him, I went, oh my God. And it was a really good picture, really good picture. And I'm like, holy cow, we now have him. We have a picture of the suspect. He purchased the calling card that was used to hoax Mount Washington, no doubt, right there on TV. This is a huge break. Call Buddy and tell him, you know, we have a photo of him. I was excited. 300 million people in the United States, and I got it down to one guy in a Walmart. I'm ready to kick it in overdrive. I'm ready to go. The problem was, because those videos are from above, it's not the greatest picture of his face. How are we going to try to identify this person? So we decided that now we have to go back to my tape, because my tape is entrance and exits. So here we go again. We're back in a 12 by 12 room with six monitors going, getting a headache. But we knew who we were looking for. And then all of a sudden, bang. He walked in. Same guy. The minute he came in, I went, that's him. Just like that, I knew it. He walks in with a jacket on, sunglasses, and he looks like he's just ready to go to work or just coming back from work, very neat. I notice a braid on the side of his pants. I'm like, what the fuck? That braid on the side of the pants, it's police. He's a cop. Finally, it's now time to get off the phones and boots on the ground. We're going to Panama City to find him. I fly down to Panama City. Me and the sun are evil enemies. It's hot. Panama City, it's a vacation spot. I think a perfect place in this area to make these phone calls because you know most of the people here are transient. They're just here for a few days, a week. No one cares, no one knows you. And we're searching for a ghost. Who is this person in the video? Could be anywhere. We go into the Panama City Police Department meet up with their detectives, get the laptop going and, and showing them these pictures to see if they could assist in any way. Brought up the photo. And they're all like, no, we don't recognize him. We don't recognize him. If he was a cop, I figured they'd know him. And they all looked at him and said, no, it's not a cop. It's not a cop. And I'm like, then why is he wearing police pants? And they say, it's not police pants. I go, what? That's a corrections uniform. He's a corrections officer. But I'm like, wait a minute here, what? I was shocked that it could be a cop. I didn't want it to be a cop. 
And now I was kind of surprised. Was it? No, absolutely not a cop. Correction. But we're still looking in the right direction. We shrunk the pool of suspects down from the entire state of Florida to law enforcement to corrections employees. Now I have a better feeling that we're going to identify. While we're trying to find out where the callers come from, I'm reviewing other cases, but my main goal is to try to bring some justice for Louise, her being a victim in this case. Investigators say a man claiming to be a police officer called to McDonald's in Mount Washington in April of 2004. He told the supervisor that Louise Ogborn was a suspect in a theft. He then ordered the supervisor and her fiance to strip search Ogborn and perform sexual acts. The fiance, Walter Nix, said he thought the man on the phone was an actual police officer. Subject had a way of compelling them, making them believe what he, uh, what he was telling them and, and, and convincing them that they needed to, to follow his directions. Certainly in this case, the hoax caller is the criminal, is the villain. But people are blaming Donna Summers, and they were blaming her fiance, Walter Nix. Just because we can't find the caller, don't think for one minute. These two game players are not getting charged and not getting dealt with. It didn't look good for Nix. He had some serious charges. We had him dead to rights, and there was no way that he could talk his way out of it. Walter Nix uh, doesn't have a great case, and he pleads to sex crimes. He has to be on the sex offender's registry, and he has to serve those five years in prison. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Lori Lyle. A Bullock County man is headed to prison for following what he thought was to be police orders to sexually abuse a teenage girl. Mr. Nix is truly a good person who got caught in a unique situation and made a very bad choice. The judge disagreed on Nix's good character. He denied the first plea agreement for probation only, but accepted a new deal, including a prison sentence. It is absolutely amazing to me that anyone would commit these kind of acts based on a telephone call. Nix ended up after his plea deal, he ended up getting sentenced to five years in state penitentiary. Donna Summers, she did a bad thing. She did it intentionally. Nobody held a gun to her head and told, told her what she did. She did what the uh, caller told her to do, and she ought to have enough sense to know not to do that. Donna Summers also enters a plea, but hers is an offered plea, which means you admit guilt because there's enough evidence to convict you, but you still maintain your innocence under the eyes of the law. So she pleads guilty to a misdemeanor and gets a year probation. Physically, Donna didn't go to jail, but uh, Donna got fired by McDonald's. They terminated her employment. They dropped her like a hot potato. Her face ended up being the, uh, on the 6 o'clock news quite a bit over this uh, case, and so her work career, she was probably ruined. I was following the instructions of what I was told to do by the caller. It wasn't anything that I wanted to do intentionally. I'm not a criminal. And I have such guilt such unprofound guilt about what happened. It has actually destroyed my life. It has absolutely destroyed it. Donna need to be held accountable for action. She need to pay the fiddler here a little bit. Walter Nix and Donna Summers were the ones that let it happen. But we knew we had a bad guy, and we knew he had a bad guy that thought he could do any damn thing he wanted. Because he'd been doing it for 10 years, and he didn't think he could get caught, and he was going to keep on going and going and going. I could not believe that we had marched forward in this case trying to solve it. And now we're up to 73 cases in 32 states, and the phone's still ringing every day.
most people say they would never believe someone on the phone is asking them to conduct a strip search. However, this hoax caller must be very good at what he was doing. A lot of people that I talked to said, well, hell, I wouldn't do that. Why didn't they just hang up the phone? Well, I was like everyone. I was astonished when I first read about the hoax case, and I probably had the reaction that most people have, which is, how could anybody do that? But then I remembered that that's the same reaction people have when they look at the Milgram study. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let Go me on. out. Let me out. Stanley Milgram was interested in the question of why so many people go along with authority figures, even when those authority figures are giving instructions to do something terribly wrong. Milgram created an artificial situation in a laboratory working on these obedience studies. There were three characters involved. One person was the experimenter who ran the study. One person was the real participant, and the third person was an actor who was pretending to be a participant. The teacher is instructed to give a simple memory test. If the learner got the wrong answer, then he was supposed to get an electric shock, and the teacher's job was to, to deliver the electric shock. Of course, the real shocks were not being delivered, and it was set up so that the person pretending to be a participant was always going to be the learner. The learner did give a lot of wrong answers on purpose so that the teacher was required to give stronger and stronger electric shocks. Wrong. 225 volts. The word is noise. 65% of Milgram's participants continued to deliver what they thought was extremely painful and perhaps even lethal doses of electric shock. These people were agonizing every time they had to press a shock lever. Yet, despite those internal resistances that they were experiencing, the situation was so powerful they found themselves nonetheless pressing the levers. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But why didn't you just stop? He wouldn't let me. I wanted to stop. What's most intriguing about that is that what that tells all of us is that under the right circumstances, any one of us is probably capable of doing some very disturbing and maybe some very uncharacteristic things. matter of a few hours, I went from doing something right for somebody to facing life in prison. Just because I took this phone call, I was gullible, I was, I believed. I believed in authority and I believed that it was a policeman. And I believed that I was helping somebody get out of a situation where she was accused of. went to the jail, and I met Alan. He's telling me the story about a, an, an imposter posing as a police officer over the phone and getting him to do these, these terrible things. He was charged with some serious offenses, including rape and kidnapping. But Alan did not fit any profile of a rapist or a kidnapper that I had ever uh, been acquainted with. I took the case and agreed to, to handle it for the family and take it all the way. When I got the job at Hardy's, I was in my early 50s. I went in as an assistant manager. I was pretty much new on the job at Hardy's, still learning the ropes. That afternoon, I was about to get off my shift phone rang, so I, I grabbed the phone. The gentleman said, I'm so-and-so from the Rapid City Police Department. I have a complaint that one of you are 
employees have stole money from a customer. The cop said, Rob's was where to go to the police station and be strip searched, or she could be strip searched at Hardy's. She agreed that she would rather be strip searched at Hardy's than to go down to the police department. I'm on the phone, and he starts telling me the process, you know. Take off her shoes, and then anybody in her shoes, and then take off her, her blouse, and check the sleeves. It was every piece of clothing that I needed to have her take off and check to see if she had any money stashed anywhere. During that time, the young lady is on the phone 13 times with the caller. She can also hear the caller as Alan is hearing him give the directions as to what the next step is. He, his voice sounded very precise, very demanding. I was just like, um, no, I don't want to be part of this, but I felt that I didn't have any choice. And then, then he continued on with other demands. The caller actually asked him to do specific things which involved touching intimate areas of her physically. I knew I needed to end what was taking place. That I did know. And about that time, my assistant came in. And it's like, oh my god, what did I just do? I just got out of there. I went home. Through psychological manipulation and coercion, Alan did something he regretted terribly. I started questioning myself. Is it a cop? Was it a prank? What, what really just took place? I was in a state of shock. And then the next morning, I went back down to Hardy's. And uh, there were two detectives there, and they charged me with three felonies. Two kidnapping and one secondary rape. In my mind, from a very early stage in, in my investigation, Alan was a, was a victim as well. Perhaps the most critical feature of our case was that there was a camera that recorded the entirety of the two and a half, three hour strip search. It was all on video. The young lady asked at the outset that Alan cover, please cover the camera. He said, no, no, no. He emphatically declined to hide the events in that room. No criminal would want a documentation through video of his conduct. It, it is absurd. The trial is, is pretty much a blur to me. The only thing I remember is me being on the stand and him getting to tell the truth. He was uh, honest, and that's who Alan was. A jury had to know Alan. They had to see what's inside. I was unconscious, uh, had no clue what they might say, just thinking, wow, I could spend the rest of my life in prison. And the judge asked the jury, have you reached a verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant to the charge of rape and kidnapping. Not guilty. It's like, there's people that believed me. Because I didn't know if there was any, any ever anybody that would believe me, other than my family, of course. Turned my life upside down personal relationships, 
all they thought is like, how could somebody do this? I didn't want to be a part of him. And even, even a couple of my friends for life exited my friendship. All I would like to say to that young lady is, I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and it's, it's just something that, you know, it's something that's been a dark cloud over me for all my life. City and I'm tracking the hoax caller. We realize he's not a cop and he works in the jail. There's three jails in the area. We're going. We hit the first correctional facility, get into the warden's office, open up the laptop, thinking, here we go, it's gonna be so easy. And they look at it and they're like, no, I don't know who that is. They didn't know who the hell he was. So we pack up, get in the car, and head to the second one. We're getting closer, somebody will know who he is. I spent the last 32 years in corrections. June 30th, I was at work, normal duties. Chief at the Bay County Jail called and said that he had some investigators that had a picture and they wanted us to look at it. Sure, come on. We go in to the second jail, go through security, then to the warden's office. We're with the warden, one of the security personnel. showed us a uh, screenshot of a surveillance shot from Walmart in Callaway. It was an overhead shot over the register. And you could see that, as soon as we looked at it, holy shit, there's David Stewart. And I go, what? David Stewart. I asked the warden, David Stewart, is does he work facility? And the warden goes, not only does he work facilities, but I mean, he's here right now. You gotta be kidding me. So not only did he identify him, he's in the facility as we speak. We went to the warden, said, we're ready for him. Bring him up. The warden comes in, individual behind him was the absolute identical picture in the video. We couldn't miss it. White male, about six feet tall, slick back black hair. I introduced myself and then I asked him, why would he think that we're down here speaking with him today? And he said, I have no idea. I mean, he's only in there 30 seconds and he's already very uncomfortable. And I'm like, game time, because I knew we have them. I said, we know you made the hoax phone calls to Massachusetts and other communities throughout the United States. And at that point, he started to sweat, shake. You think, OK, good. But he said, was anybody hurt? And after that, he goes, thank God it's over. At that moment, when he made those statements, I thought I had the guy, without question. I said. We have you on video purchasing calling cards. He said, I, mean, I didn't make the calls. I didn't make the calls. He denied buying any cards. He won't admit it, and he pleads the fifth. So we stopped the interview. Didn't say another word. I needed a confession, and he didn't give it to me. This investigation is hanging by a thread. I needed more evidence. So now we go back to Panama City Detective's office. 
and then we say, okay, what's the next step? What are we gonna do? I decide we need to do a search warrant in his house. He has a trailer. David Stewart had no idea they're gonna search the house until he opened the door. Panama City detectives do a full search of the property and found numerous police magazines. He put in applications for numerous police jobs throughout the area. We also found diaries. He was obviously at one point a, a part-time police officer at some county or a local department, and he'd put stuff like Monday, April 21st, rode with Brock, chase someone doing 125 miles an hour. Wednesday, April 30th, chase sergeant 140 miles an hour. He was obsessed with being a police officer. You could tell that excited him. You know, it just doesn't help my case. I need to get the smoking gun. They search all the grounds, outside, sheds, and then Boom. Found a calling card. The key piece of evidence was a prepaid calling card. My job at this point is to convince the DA of charges. Well, I wanted him to get charged with some type of sexual assault. The DA thought it would be too hard to convict David Stewart of a sex crime since it was just a hoax call and he physically wasn't there. He was on the phone. 10 years this individual is making these calls. I find him and nobody wants to charge him. It's fucking unbelievable. Then I call Buddy Stubb, Mount Washington. I received a phone call from Vic and I said, what the hell you can't, you can't charge him? You're telling me this guy could skip out and we could lose him? So I said, this, we gotta put an end to this shit and I went as hard as I could go and to get a warrant. And we met with the county attorney, the commonwealth attorney, and a district judge. And the judge issued a warrant to arrest David Stewart. I called my wife on the phone. I said, honey, have my bags packed. I'm heading for Panama City, Florida. His ass is mine. I'm going to bring him home. We're going to have a little justice around here for all the hell he's put us through. I mean, what the hell can go wrong? The police's version of what happened is almost never what actually happened. Do I think my client, David Stewart's innocent? I know for a fact he's not guilty. That was about a 10 hour drive from uh, Florida back to Kentucky. I'm thinking that I've got a guy in the back seat that has pulled this off for 10 years and by hell he had got away with causing some pretty awful crimes to be committed. We felt like all the evidence pointed to him being the hoax caller. Nobody else. He seemed to be the average guy that you would see, the average Joe on the street. Even his co-workers at work probably thought he was a nice guy. He talked about his family some and asked him how many kids he had and, you know, some of that kind of chit-chat. David Stewart was not what I was expecting. I was surprised to find out that he was married and had kids. I figured he was a lone wolf, you know, sitting in his apartment somewhere, practicing his art. I think it started getting real for him as we're getting closer to Kentucky. put him in jail, and now I'm thinking, what are you thinking, sucker? 
You thought you were going to get away with it, but guess what? Now your ass is sitting in a place 650 miles from home and you don't know nobody. How's it feel? David Stewart was charged with solicitation of sodomy. He might not have been in the room when Louise was assaulted, but if he bought the calling card and made the call, that alone is solicitation. He was also was charged with impersonating a peace officer. These are very serious felony charges that he's looking at. I felt satisfaction. He's behind bars. No other victim is going to fall prey to him. That was a huge relief. After we put him in jail, some time goes by, and then I find out that he's got a, a, a big dog defense attorney. It was a bizarre case that I'd never seen anything like it, and I've still never seen anything like it in 30 years. I thought it, somebody was playing a practical joke or something on me because these things were alleged to have occurred over the phone. And if you think about it, it would be very difficult to sexually assault someone over the phone. My initial reaction was, well, you can't do that over the phone. It's not possible under the statute. David's bail was a half million dollars initially. This is a guy who's never been charged with an, a crime in his life. I mean, never had a speeding ticket. And so a half million dollar bond was an extraordinarily high bond in the first place. And it was important that we get a bail that the family could post. Ultimately, I think it was reduced to 100,000. The next thing I know, got out on bail. He's out of jail and he's gone. I was upset with the fact that uh, he was walking around free, but I'm, I'm thinking, OK, take your last walk. Enjoy it, buddy, because we'll, uh, we'll meet again. Today, we're going to talk about prank calls that take it way too far. In fact, these calls are plain, sadistic, and cruel. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. When I first started looking into this, it was shocking that there was even one hoax call like this. But then, come to find out that there were over 100 calls just like this in 32 states. It is incredible how long this guy got away with it. So many victims went through these horrible ordeals. It just shows that people weren't warned about the dangers of the hoax collar. The criminal trial of David Stewart was what everybody was talking about. Somebody had to be held accountable for what happened to all these different people. The real villain here is not just the prank caller. I mean, what they did is horrible, but McDonald's, in a way, are just as complicit for allowing this to continue. Louise decides she's going to go after the Goliath. She's going to go after McDonald's, and she's going to get some kind of justice. Her name, Louise Ogborn. The company, McDonald's. The two, once employee and employer, now defendant and plaintiff. All Louise Ogborn wanted was McDonald's to acknowledge that they were culpable in this whole thing. She just wanted an apology for ruining her life. So Louise Ogborn hires an attorney named Ann Oldfather, and they sue McDonald's for $200 million, and that's a lot of money. McDonald's has this searchlight of blame, and it's going on everybody else except the Golden Arches. Ann Allfather, he is known for being a, a fierce litigator. Your verdict can measure the harm that's been done to Louise in this community. This was, without a doubt, the biggest civil case ever tried in uh, Bullock County. $200 million? I think the fact that they even asked for that much tells you what this case is all about. Alright, 
please. My name's Tom McDonald. I served as a judge for 25 years in Louisville, Kentucky. Please be seated. I never thought this case would get to trial because the facts are, are so bizarre. There was an awful lot at stake. Here you have an 18-year-old woman from a small town who's going up against one of the biggest companies in the world. I mean, my thought is that they were gonna do everything in their power to make her go away. Now, Fox News at 10, your first choice for news. There's a new development in the legal fallout from a strip search hoax at a McDonald's restaurant in Mount Washington. There are charges that McDonald's intimidating witnesses, and at least one bailiff hired by the restaurant's chain's attorneys has been arrested. You gotta wonder if McDonald's strategy was to victim shame Louise Ogborn. They went after her therapy notes, they went after her MySpace account, and I think they wanted to pin this on everyone but themselves. McDonald's claimed it only had a few documents about the prior hoaxes, but Ann Oldfather did not believe that. And she started researching this and showed how many um, cases there had been previously and how McDonald's obviously knew of this danger years earlier. Louise's case is basically that, you know, McDonald's had several of these hoax callers and did they do enough to warn their employees? And their case was that, no, they did not. McDonald's acknowledged that they had settled six cases concerning hoax similar to these. They said that's all they knew. But an old father ultimately got an order from the trial judge threatening McDonald's with sanctions unless it produced what it had. 48 hours before the trial started, McDonald's delivered her boxes and boxes full of information with no time to review it. Louise Ogborn's lawyer has pages, folders, and boxes of paperwork that show McDonald's corporate office knew of more than two dozen illegal strip searches at its restaurants across the country. 16 boxes of material from McDonald's attorneys that we haven't even had time to go through. At one point, McDonald's was implying that uh, Louise was in on the hoax and that she was just trying to get uh, money from the company. Just come right on over there, sir. McDonald's got the maintenance guy, you know, the guy who ended the call, the hero who saved the day. They put him up on the stand. McDonald's made a pretty interesting, compelling case that maybe Louise Ogborn was going after the money from day one. She said she was going to get a big check or some money, and uh, did we said that? Yeah. And old father was able to poke holes in that testimony, but at the end of the day, you really don't know what the jury is thinking. Would you like to call your next witness? Yes, Your Honor. We call Louise Ogburn. There was a pretrial motion to allow the jury to view the actual videotape of the assault in its entirety. There was absolute silence in the courtroom. The only thing you could hear was some of the jurors crying. You could have heard a pin drop other than for that. Tell us, Louise, whether you have any fears that come back to you. I'd have dreams where somebody was dead and I couldn't tell you who it was. I would have fully going to sleep at night. I can't breathe. I feel like I'm hyperventilating. Um, my chest starts to hurt and my arm goes numb. Let's not forget that Louise is a victim of sexual assault. How could you not? sympathize with her. I mean, it was humiliating. 
four employees saw her at her most vulnerable moment where she was sitting there naked. I was doing what I had to do to survive. I didn't know if this was my last day on earth. I didn't know if I'd make it through. Louise Ogborn and her attorney are claiming false imprisonment. Well, McDonald says, well, that's not true. Nobody physically restrained her. She could have left at any time. The tape shows that uh, you were left alone there in the office uh, for almost 10 minutes. Did you ever go over and try the door? No, because I thought I couldn't get out. I'm sorry? I thought I couldn't get out. I think McDonald's suggestion that she should have walked out of the room was um, perhaps a strategic error to say that a, a young woman who had been deprived of her clothes and her car keys could have and should have um, put a stop to it when, when their own adult employee supervisors didn't. I think it's not too much to expect an employee to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong and to use their common sense. McDonald's trying to pin this thing on Louise Ogborn, on Donna Summers, when in reality, it was them who did not warn their employees. In this case, you see how many restaurants where this had happened and how many of them were McDonald's. And it's really, that kind of hits home. Armed with nothing but their opinions and a list of instructions, jurors are deciding if they should take a financial bite out of the largest fast food chain in the world and give it to former Mount Washington restaurant crew member, Louise Ogborn. The jury comes back into the courtroom The foreperson of the jury hands their verdict to the sheriff, who hands it to me. This was going to be the largest verdict in the history of Bullock County, Kentucky. We, the jury, find for Louise Auburn under instruction number nine and award her punitive damages against McDonald's Corporation. <laughs> Some serious cash is on the way in another high-profile civil suit. Louise Ogburn was awarded more than $6 million in a lawsuit against McDonald and others involved in the case. It wasn't the supersized award Ogborn's legal team was after, but they say they're more than happy with the money and the message it sends McDonald's. McDonald's is responsible for not protecting their employees. That's the number one thing. If they did it to protect their bottom line, not to protect their employees, they're absolutely the villain in this. It would have been so simple for McDonald's to simply notify each of the stores. Put up a thing by the telephone. Put up a sign that said, there's a hoax caller. If this occurs, don't do anything. It's a hoax. But they did not warn their employees. Do you think McDonald's tried to cover this up? I'm not going to comment on that. I think what was shocking about the civil trial was the details of how many fast food joints were involved and how many uh, settlements had happened that people didn't know about. criminal trial starts in October of 2006. You've got news crews from all over the country following this story of a young woman who was sexually assaulted inside a McDonald's because of a hoax call. Prosecutors said they traced prepaid phone cards allegedly used in the hoax to David Stewart, a former Florida prison guard. The night before the trial, I'm thinking, all right, the day's finally here. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, everything goes right. 
I think I've got it, an airtight air seal case. Romine's walked in and putting on the show that attorneys do. I'm thinking uh, Romine's can blow all the smoke he wants, he can't blow this up because every police officer that I talked to said, you got the best case in the nation. The police think every case is a slam dunk, and which is why the police's version is what's put out to the media. As we've learned over the last two years or whatever with the social justice protest and George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and cell phone cameras, the police's version of what happened is almost never what actually happened. We have David Stewart in line purchasing the Colin Hyde. We have David Stewart entering the Walmart on the day that the Massachusetts cards are purchased. We have David Stewart identified from these photos from the warden at his jail where he worked. If that's not enough evidence to convict somebody, I don't know what is. The Walmart video was really kind of portrayed as, as the bombshell or, or the irrefutable evidence of his guilt. Could it be David Stewart? Sure, it could be David Stewart. But beyond a reasonable doubt, is it David Stewart? I thought it's him. It's not like there's no question about it. Perfect match. But even with that, the, the rest of the evidence was so inconsistent. That, to me, was not, not even close to sufficient evidence in the case. We went through his work schedule. Every time a call was made that we could track down, we could show that he was not at work. He was available to make this call. And he was very familiar with the area where these, some of these calls were made from. There were some of those calls that David Stewart had an alibi, you know, that they could not refute. His wife testified that, you know, they had a set schedule, and when she worked, he was to pick up the kids. Our investigation uncovered that Stewart did not make them. He happened to be in a store when a calling card's purchased. We had a near confession. We were this close from him admitting this. He goes, thank God it's over. That was it. Didn't say another word. Plead the fifth. Done. When the police interrogate you after, for a period of time and you never admit to committing a crime, and then the, finally they're done questioning you, and you say, thank God this is over, that has a lot more to do with the police interrogating you than it does you know, a confession to a crime. Part of the, the prosecution's case was that David is this Svengali mastermind con man. It's just wholly inconsistent with, you know, the person that David Stewart had been his entire life. His lawyer painted that story that he was a family man, a good, hardworking guy, had a police officer as a brother, and really did a good job of telling the jury that David Stewart is not the guy. The jury came back after only two hours of being out. I didn't really know what to think. David Stewart was facing 10 to 20 years. The judge asked him if they've reached a verdict, and they say yes. It kind of sucks all the air out of the room. Will the jury find the defendant not guilty of solicitation to commit first degree sexual abuse? There has been an unbelievable end to an unbelievable Florida story involving what amounted to a long distance rape. It was like I've been hit with a two before. I mean, my heart just sort of sank down in my gut. 
I just went, I'm numb. I'm like, what the fuck? People were just stunned. The case was not won. There wasn't enough proof, there wasn't enough evidence for a jury to believe that it was David Stewart. Maybe I could have done a better job interviewing him. Maybe we should have not interviewed him and hoped that we didn't know we were there and put him into surveillance. In my view, we didn't arrest the wrong guy. We thought we arrested the right guy. He was brought to trial, found not guilty. That's the process. Could I have arrested the wrong guy? I don't think so. I mean, nobody dropped those calling cards in his room. There are a lot of questions that have never been asked that need to be asked. The only thing I knew was is my client didn't do it, and the jury agreed. To my knowledge, still today, uh, I've not been made aware of this exact crime uh, still ever happening again. What's really hard to believe is that only eight people were charged, and they were managers of the restaurants, not the caller. But there were hundreds of calls, and you know, people wonder, what happened here? Were all the cases not investigated? Were people afraid to report it? Justice wasn't served to the caller. Whoever made those calls is a disturbed individual. Who is it? This individual, this hoax caller, is an evil sex predator, dangerous to society. The calls have stopped for now. But have they stopped for good? It's a tough day for the traffic cops next. It's about as bad as it can get. We're out on patrol after the break.